So I'm going to start off by talking about the management strategy and how that's evolving. But before that, my name is Sunmil Bumkar. Uh, I lead a product management team for wireless experiences uh, within Cisco Wireless. And with me, I have Scott. Scott. Hi, Scott Irie. I'm a technical marketing engineer on the cloud team. Uh, I'm working closely with Samil and everyone on the cloud uh, backend stuff that we're doing uh, for wireless. All right. So as Paul mentioned, right, there's one team. Now we're thinking about common strategy uh, that includes management. Uh, and I think that has been one of the challenges for Cisco. And so the way we are thinking about this is Cisco has a large customer base, right? And they are going to have different consumption models. The market is moving towards cloud, but not all of them will. Some customers are going to want to be on-prem or they want to manage their own instances. And for that, we have DNA Center and it's continuing to be there. We will have updates on that in the second session, but today we want to talk about what's happening with the Meraki dashboard and what are we doing to kind of bring both the products within the Meraki dashboard and how that experience is going to look like. Now, as Paul mentioned, I think we are trying to bring in func uh, functionality to kind of have that warm handoff, so have that journey because investment protection is big uh, for our Cisco customers, so that's definitely top of mind for us. And so you are going to hear more about what we're going to do uh, for Catalyst Wireless. Scott is going to do the demo. Uh, but before that, I do want to talk about Meraki Dashboard. There's a lot of things that are happening on Meraki Dashboard as we scale. It's available globally. And some of the things uh, we have not talked about, but Meraki initially started in 2006 with its own data centers. Uh, in 2006, the technology that we had. 16 years, 17 years later, I think we've evolved a lot. I think we've made that transition to the new architecture with microservices. We are actually running hybrid footprint. Some of it is running in AWS already, right? And then one of the new uh, things that we are hearing about is data sovereignty or data residency needs. GDPR compliance, now every country is coming up with their own. So what we initially did was we built a China cloud. So China cloud is its own cluster. Uh, the, for the data residency needs, you have to go to dashboard.meraki.cn and that's uh, its own uh, cluster. We launched the Canada cloud, uh, another geo cloud. And so now it's uh, dashboard.meraki.ca, I believe. <clears throat> and that's completely hosted in AWS. Uh, so we have uh, a hybrid cloud that we are running today. And then I think last week, we announced Cisco Meraki for government. We are doing FedRAM certification for Meraki dashboard for our government customers that they need. I think uh, a lot of uh, state and local bodies are also starting to think about FedRAM. And so we're definitely working with them. We are in process now for that as well. The public announcement went out sometime late last week. So all of this is happening, and all of this is enabling us to provide uh, solutions at scale for our customers. And that scale is growing every day. And some of the numbers are really staggering. I started at Cisco six years ago. And when I started, I think the one number that blows my mind is the APIs. My first ever customer meeting I actually talked about APIs. That number was 1 million calls a month. That number has swelled to 8 billion. There's a lot of deployment. There's a lot of automation that customers are doing with Meraki dashboard and rolling out sites. People have automated so much that they're just drop shipping equipment and they're just scanning devices and just deploying it. They've automated completely. There's also solutions that customers have built on top of the Meraki dashboard because it's not just a management platform. It's also a platform to extract data because some of our larger customers, they want to extract that data and they want to use it uh, for their own uh, you know, ways they use. But there's another aspect that it enables us to do. It gives us visibility. As Paul talked about, one of the things that it allows us to do is gain visibility into customer networks. And I'm going to talk about how we're using that data to help our customers. There are th two things that I want to talk about, two key 
uh, metrics to keep in mind as I go through the presentation. The number of devices online, there's 12 million devices. We take that insights and we provide solutions, but also the end user devices. There's close to 200 million end user devices. The reason that's important is, as we know for wireless, every time we troubleshoot, we are dependent on the client devices making some decisions, which means we are dependent on some of the client driver behaviors. And so that's very important to understand how the client devices are behaving. And so having that much uh, scale and visibility helps us deliver on some solutions. Now, as I mentioned, right, as we are starting to deploy more and more networks, sorry, these are being deployed at scale. And as we've transitioned to microservices, it has enabled us to deliver on the scale. Uh, Last year, we were just getting out of the pandemic. Since then, we've had 1,000 plus deployments uh, that have rolled out. And every time we release a new code, uh, we run so many automated tests. It's a matrix, really. Because if you think we have around 20, 30 APs that we are actively supporting, and every time we roll out a code, we need to make sure that they are working well. And some of our customers mix those APs, so the interop for those also needs to be tested. So this entire matrix is being tested and monitored at scale as we roll out. And so as Meraki dashboard scales, obviously these things are also scaling behind the scenes because intelligence is not something that you see in dashboard, it's also how we operate uh, behind the scenes. And what this allows us to do, it allows us to get trends. It allows us to understand how our customers are deploying. So for example, WPA3, fairly new. Our WPA3, how, how many clients we are seeing, uh, what devices are using WPA3. So we have millions of devices already using WPA3. And then we have partnerships with Apple and Intel. What are some of the insights that we are getting from those? How are these insights coming along? How many events are being reported? These are some of the things that we have started to look into. And the reason I bring this up is because it allows us to also look at any anomalies that are starting to come up, right? And this is key because all of this ties into how we roll out our firmware. What we are doing is anytime we roll out our firmware, we actually monitor how the firmware is being used in the field. Are there any problems that we are seeing? Are there any rollbacks? And any time a customer does a rollback, we look at the feedback from those customers. And as we look at the feedback, we actually, our AI engine does an NLP analysis. And then if we start detecting any themes, any trends, any anomalies, we start a proactive investigation and do an outreach. One of our customers, actually in one of our firmware releases, there were three issues that we caught. And one of those issues was impacting 12 customers. There were no tickets. In some cases, customers didn't even know that they had issues. We reached out, worked with them, fixed the issue, and rolled out the fix. So the anomaly detection is very key here because at the end of the day, as Fal mentioned, you roll out a firmware, and next day morning, you need to have that peace of mind that everything's working well. And we are continuously monitoring to understand what is happening in the field? So, quick, yes, <laughs> I was. Go ahead. Yeah, no, go. go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> no, no, no. Right. So, two questions. Um, one is, uh, so with the firmware upgrades, you will basically—is this something that will only happen if the customer <coughs> says that I'm having issues, or is this something that you will proactively monitor, like every time there's a new firmware that gets rolled out? Hey, customer in this region. The, these two customers have this issue after rolling on this firmware in this region, they're having this issue. Now we need to kind of notify them or something like that. Is it something like that or is it's it something continuously only monitored? you? It's continuously monitored. Okay. Uh, and it's monitored like we are not doing a firmware rollout right now, but it's also continuously being monitored. If there's any anomalies, it kickstarts uh, investigation on our end mm -hmm. and we can do a proactive notification at that point. Of to the customer directly? Yes. Okay. So the second uh, question, follow-up question, this also applies on the controller side too, because you know, 
firmware bugs and code issues and all that kind of stuff. I mean, how, how will you kind of deal with on the controller side? Something similar somehow? Give me a minute. Okay, sure. We are going to talk about what's next for Catalyst. Okay. And I think as we talk to the demo, uh, we are thinking about it from that angle for sure. Okay. I think we're not there yet, but we are definitely thinking about it from that angle. Okay. Now, why did I talk about this? This process was not done overnight. It took us, um, you know, some time uh, to kind of perfect this because initially we started with what do we want to monitor, how do we want to monitor, what, how do we want to define metrics, how do we detect anomalies. <clears throat> the reason, the thing that this has enabled us to do is now we've created this process to kind of detect anomalies at larger scale across our data lake. <clears throat> what this also enables us to do is take this and also potentially apply it to, remember the client devices I mentioned? We have partnerships with Apple and Intel and Samsung. We can now extend this to those devices. And one of the things that we are doing, I'm just gonna give you a basic snapshot. One of the things we are doing is we are now starting to look at the devices. Apple tells us what OS is running, what devices it's running, and Apple gives us codes, failures. We have that telemetry coming in. Now we can understand how that anomalies are. So if you look at this graph, there's no scale, but I'll tell you how to read this. This graph is telling me about splash face failures on Apple devices, and the, the red and the pink are the anomalies that you see with the failures. Now across all of the Apple devices connecting to Meraki dashboard, we can see what these anomalies are. Now, obviously, we have to sanitize this data before we show it. But I think using the firmware rollout algorithm that we have to detect anomalies at scale, it allows us to look at what is happening. See, because at the end of the day, every September, when there is a new firmware release from Apple, you know, there is somebody that gets a call next day saying, my Wi-Fi was working well yesterday, but now it doesn't work. And then you're scratching your head, there's no config changes, what may have changed? These are the things that are coming up. Or in some cases, there might be situations where you may upgrade firmware on the AP one night, the same night you may upgrade the driver on the device, and the next day morning, devices don't connect, and there's finger pointing. This has happened. And so in situations like these, you know, people want to know what is happening on the device side. It's a big problem in the industry because Wi-Fi technology is dependent on the client behavior. You said unified uh, development teams now, right? Yes. And so you're obviously talking about Meraki, and you sort of deferred the catalyst question. Um, but I expect at some point the development efforts, because it's a unified team, the, the things you discover on the Meraki side eventually make their way into the catalyst software builds, like driver defects, software bugs, the, the, all of those things, right? Yes. So it's a... There are efforts uh, happening to kind of normalize that. And I don't have a lot of details to share today, but we will okay. in future. But as I start talking about what's next for Catalyst, I think one of the things you will start is the data lake is starting to merge. So and, things and like so these... So we're going to get insights out of Catalyst at some point? Is that the... Yes. So as long as devices are connecting to Meraki dashboard, right, we can give these device insights. So one of the things we already do in Meraki dashboard is peer insights. Uh, you can see channel utilization across industries. What's that happening across uh, manufacturing? What is happening across education? Because I think channel utilization, there is no right answer. All I know is it cannot be zero, it cannot be 100. <laughs> right? That's the only right answer for that question. But in the middle, What's the norm for the industry? I think we can see some of this information and we can give that to our customers. So you can make an educated guess and we can give you recommendations like how many dual band clients are using uh, uh, 2.4. Right. So that is actionable insights for you to kind of go ahead and you know move on from there. <clears throat> All right, so once we get the device insights, as I mentioned, it allows us to detect systemic issues. I talked about splash page failures before. I can, we can also see auth failures. What is happening, right? And what it inherently leads us to do is give us, give the OS recommendations. 
Now we're barely scratching the surface here. This is not something that we have launched. This is something that we internally are also, you know, looking at data, trying to understand how we make it available to our customers. Because one of the problems is, if you don't do it correctly, the next day, we might get a call from Apple. What did you do? <laughs> so we have to be we have to be mindful. With data comes great power. So we have to be mindful. Uh, but these are the things that it is now setting us up to do. And I think as you hear from Jim as well, he's going to talk about you know how we are using uh, the common engine and the data lake from unifying services. But some of these you will start to hear more and more from us. Now. There is a question. What about Catalyst? I talked about Meraki dashboard, right? So Catalyst is going to start connecting to Meraki dashboard. You will hear more about that later in the year. Uh, this will be available. But we announced cloud monitoring for switching last year. And now we are extending it to wireless. It's the same look and feel. It's the same feature and functionality that's coming to Meraki dashboard. And you will have the same uh, you know, data uh, uh, from assurance perspective that will start to show up in the Meraki dashboard. And Scott, I'm going to hand it over to you Alrighty. to actually do the demo. Because Scott is going to show us how that's going to look like in Meraki dashboard. Uh, in an early development cycle, we already have this working. So you have a controller that's checking into Meraki dashboard. I, quick question before you. Yes. Sorry. So you said Catalyst will start connecting to Meraki dashboard. So are we talking, for example, like like a controller connecting to Meraki dashboard? Yes. Okay. Yes, we are. Let, let's hear the demo. I don't want to take Scott's thunder. Yeah. Let's see the demo. Well, welcome, everybody. Thank you for letting us take a look, um, get, give you a look into cloud monitoring for Catalyst Wireless. So as Samil said, we launched switching nine months ago, give or take, at Cisco Live last year. Um, we are now getting ready uh, and working on building that same experience for Catalyst Wireless controllers. This will be the first sneak peek we'll be giving into the Catalyst Wireless controller page. So excited to share this first uh, run with you. We are still in development here, so very early cycles but ready to, to give you that first glimpse. I wanted to start off though by showing an access point page. This I'm sure for those of you who are familiar, any, uh, familiar with MRs, uh, this is a catalyst access point, but it's very closely mimicking and paralleling the, the MR, MR, MR experience. So we can see with our live data, we've got clients, we've got channel utilizations, historical data, all stuff you're very familiar with saying uh, if you're, uh, been using MR uh, in dashboard. But you'll notice some differences. We do have, of course, some catalyst specific things for these access points. We, of course, want to be able to see on this page what controller our access point is associated with. Uh, we want to be able to see what mode the AP is. And so in this case, we have a local mode AP. We'll be able to display if it's flex mode, any other type mode that's in there. Oh, there goes the mic. And importantly on this screen too, you will also see what we are showing um, what site tags are assigned uh, to the controller, to the access point. We've got the site tag, policy tag, and RF tag. So we'll be able to see those things for the access point. One really thing I wanted to point out here is how this is going to be architected at launch. You'll notice that this site tag here is uh, same as our network name up here. So one of the ways at launch we'll be supporting onboarding your controllers and access points will be actually mapping APs to networks based on their site tag. Um, we'll, you'll have an option to choose when you onboard the controller to say, hey, I want to map APs into networks based on this site tag. We'll create the network and dashboard, and we'll put the APs in it. But that's just one of the ways we'll be doing uh, AP onboarding. There'll be other options available as well, but we're excited about automating that process. Uh, you'll be able to onboard the controller, but then we'll take care of onboarding all the access points automatically. So if I add an AP to a controller just operationally, like as yep. a matter of course, it's just going to yep. magically show up in the cloud. I'm going to magically start getting analytics data out of it. I'm you got it. Ma yep. Just like magic. Yeah, like I said, we'll do it based on, there'll be a, at launch, we're going to do it based on site tag, or you'll be able to say, I just want all these P's in this given network, yep. right? So that helps. Uh, but we do know there's large centralized deployments where you might have multiple buildings on a single controller that you will need to, you know. And then you're going to auto place it on a map for me when I'm done, so I don't have to touch anything, right? <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. But we're trying to make it simple. 
Okay. Right. So yeah, that is the really cool thing about the onboarding and the tag policy thing we'll be doing. And of course, like I said, long term, we'll have more ways you can organize based on filtering AP names, uh, IP address ranges, things like that. But at launch, you build an architect it's, uh, with your site tags and we'll create networks based on that. So all that I'm configuring in there, right? Like I'm not having to log into the controller through CLI or directly connecting to it. Then I'm back and I'm building the whole template in there. Controllers connecting to it and then downloading. So your controller in this case is more of a brownfield example. So you're connecting your controller that's already in deployment into into dashboard for monitoring. So this is so we're starting monitoring. with monitoring. Yes, we're yeah. starting with monitoring. Yes, okay. this is cloud monitoring for Catalyst for sure. Okay. Yep, um, and that is what we're launching with the start. Yep. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, we have a slide on it, but we will talk about some of the uh, integration, how it's working on the controller. So, of course, you'll be able to go into your controller page. And let me pop this up real quick. So this is the first uh, public viewing here that we've shown on their controller page. Of course, MRs, we have very capabilities to, to mimic what we're doing there. But in Dashboard, there's no existing controller. So this page is being built out and flushed from scratch. And it's still early in development. Uh, some of these things, speaking of cloud um, agility, right? Some of these things were literally just pushed <laughs> this week. So we can scale and push these things very quickly. And we're excited about that. So we, we want to give the wireless land control page all about thinking about the health of your controller, right? So we want to make it um, visible to know what your health status is. So right now, we don't see a lot of um, the icons glowing, things like that. This is a uh, non-production development system. But you'll be able to see, you know, like all Meraki devices typically have our front panel ports here. You'll be able to highlight, we'll show these things green and orange when they're learning, taking errors, green when they're up, when they disconnect. This particular uh, is a 9880. Uh, of course, we'll be supporting uh, all flavors of physical hardware at launch. We'll be doing a uh, live data section. So you'll be able to see your access points and clients currently associated to the controller. Uh, this will eventually show the all will be replaced with the actual numbers online and we'll also have a disassociated, uh, recently disassociated count. So you can see the health of your APs if they're coming up or down, things like that. Okay, so yes. one question. When you say all flavors of hardware, I'm going to assume um, that you mean Catalyst 9000 Hardware. I'll talk about that. Yeah, we have another slide coming on that. I'll talk about that. Yeah. Okay. I'll catalyst physical hardware at launch. Well, including the 8540s and, and no, talk about catalyst. We'll talk about that. But catalyst talk one. about the models. There's okay. some dependency there. So, one thing you'll notice see the dashboard um, as part of that health experience, we know one of the ways that you want to track and see the health of your system is we want to be able to view the controller CPU and memory utilization over time. So, here we have some historical data. Showing the CPU and memory right here in Dashboard. This is new to Dashboard. Uh, we don't have any devices now where we display this, uh, but we felt it was a critical piece for Catalyst customers as part of the troubleshooting and processing the process, as well as knowing the health of your device. So we, we've got, to start with, we've got these built-in thresholds. You'll be able to see over time when you may have passed a threshold for memory CPU. Uh, right now, um, this is a sample graph of CPU we will have some drop downs or some, some type of forward there, we will be able to see the CPU of all the different cores yeah. on the controller. And then have some kind of functionality in there, something in there that where I, customers want to, might want to see certain things in there in the dashboard uh, and all that. Like, will you take customer feedback and in and, and, and creating some kind of dashboard that they can customize? Yeah, and that's a lot where this has already come from. Lots of extensive UX uh, experience research we, we've done. Um, and we'll continue to evolve that as we get closer to, to launch, for sure. There's going to be continuous uh, additions to this. Uh, we can definitely see that. Uh, and I think you'll see more and more coming. One of the advantages we have with cloud is like as soon as it's connected, right, uh, we can release features uh, very quickly with cloud. I think uh, a lot of people ask me, like, how often do you release features? I think we try to do it like a couple of times a quarter. but we can go beyond that, but I think at Cisco we have a rigor of uh, you know comms and uh, educating the field. But I think from a development perspective, I think at any given the last time I checked, there were around three hundred merges a day. Uh, okay. So that's how that. A couple of questions from social media, and they want to kind of know about like how will it interface also with DNAC? Uh, like just like we can bring controllers in there, will 
being agri integrated or and well and then I guess a follow up on that is is that if you complete your current roadmap, where does DNAC play in this um, in this new setup? So uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, right, uh, for DNAC, I think a lot of customers still want to manage their own management platform. And for them, DNAC is going to be there. I think from customers that want to move to cloud, it's it's basically a consumption model from a customer. Like, I don't want to manage my management platform. I want Cisco to manage it for us. The DNAC is not going away. I mean, I, no, either or. No, 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 no. But either or is. Yeah, it's true. either or. Yeah, so that's our controller page. Oh, you know, we got a few, and you know, we'll have very 200 phase status over time. You'll be able to see up and down status, things like that. So you yes. talked um, about moving to microservices. Yes. Where am I going to see microservices in the cloud? In in the dashboard, is it going to show me not just the hardware view, but now the services view in the dashboard? How those so are forming? We've never shown service by service right. view. So for example, the splash pages that you saw, right? Right. They're already like their own microservices. Like if we make any changes, that's happening in parallel. So it's it's fairly transparent to customers. There are certain services that are running in the back end that we've transitioned already. So it's not like customers will see like, oh, this is the health of my service because this is running in microservice container A or this is running in microservice container B. It's it's very uh, behind the scenes that happens. Okay, so when they make, because um, you talked about right at the beginning, external API calls, um, and I, I wasn't quite sure what those were, you know, what's being called, but I'm assuming they're calling some sort of microservice. So I'm wondering, are you giving your customers visibility and help with, with doing that piece? So the way the APIs work, right? So there can be configuration. I think that's pretty straightforward from a config perspective, but then there are, uh, location APIs. So location is its own service that's running. Uh, you start pulling information from there. Uh, I think if there are any uh, uh, maintenance services that are happening on that microservices, uh, if we have to ever uh, do any comms, then customers will be notified uh, for that. So it happens very much on a case-by-case -case basis uh, behind the scenes, and customers will be notified if uh, there's anything happening. And they'll be notified not through the dashboard, they'll be notified how? So actually in dashboard, we released a section uh, to talk about uh, public announcements uh, and if there's any uh, uh, performance improvements or outages that are happening. So within dashboard also, no, there's like... Now. There's an outages page. There's now. an outages yeah. page. It's not real-time, spontaneous, it's informational. Yes, but yeah. like uh, we have monitoring uh, and as soon as we detect something, I think we then notify because I think from a comms perspective, uh, we have to be uh, mind, uh, we have to be uh, uh, methodical about how we notify customers. There's some policies, so I think that's how we've uh, done that. Okay, thank you. How does licensing work for it? Do we need DNA licensing and Meraki licensing. Excellent question. In the initial slide, <laughs> I mentioned for cloud monitoring, use your existing DNA licensing. Just connect to Meraki dashboard. What, what what about when it moves beyond monitoring? I'm assuming that it will eventually, right? We will have an answer for you in future, <laughs> not right now. But right now, what we are saying is no new licenses. Keep using what you are already. That's the next step, right? So coming back to your question, uh, what is included? So we have all of the 9,100 access points, 28, 3,800 access points, and uh, 9,800 series controllers. What we are doing also with these is natively asking customers, like natively there will be a way to connect to Meraki dashboard. So you go to a controller and you say connect to Meraki dashboard. I don't know the exact CLI command or the GUI command yet, but natively we will say connect to Meraki dashboard. Today there's an onboarding app that goes away. It's appless onboarding. You just say connect and it starts populating information within Meraki dashboard. With some of the older hardware, would there be any way to take, for example, a fleet of 3,800 that are currently bound to ROS controllers and flat and you know reimage them with a firmware that will allow them to connect to the Meraki dashboard and just be natively managed as autonomous access points. No, not right now. There are a lot of updates, but I think there's a lot happening. As you can see, everything's coming together. Uh, the reason why we're doing this is we want a single management platform for our customers. I think for the longest time people have had like multitude of management platforms so for management strategy. I think we are what we are selling is if you want to go to public cloud, Meraki dashboard, if you want to manage your own uh, management platform, 
DNAC is there, but two options, and you start bringing it in, in either one of those. What this allows us is, as I sh showed, it allows us to bring services together. And how those are coming together is what my uh, Jim is going to talk about. Before you move on to Jim, I think Fal was Fal said earlier something about um, you know campus use cases in the Meraki dashboard. We have some centralized data plane concern. So the answer to that is eventually going to be controllers in the dashboard, which we just saw, or is that going to be another answer later? I don't want to steal his thunder. <laughs> Paul wants to come and talk. Answer that, but I'll drag your microphone. Um, so the question, I think everybody heard it. What's our answer for campus scale yeah. cloud managed solution? Tunnel architecture is one of the best things wireless technologies introduced 20 years ago. It's not going away. We need to bring that in. So you will see us. So it's not a direct answer. Answer is yes. We're working on it. It's pretty exciting what we're bringing it up. The good news is one engineering team who's built Catalyst controllers, AOS controllers, are looking at it, going deep on it. The idea is distribute everything that we can, centralize what we must. So only the least amount of portion that's needed to be centralized. Tunnel architecture is centralized. Yeah. Control plane can be distributed as much. So, right, the decision making stays on premise. Management centralized. That's the architecture. One engineering team, very exciting. And we can't wait for some more months to click by to bring that solution. Only physical WSEs? So the right now, yes, we are talking so we about can't TL. the cloud. We can't monitor the cloud WLC. In we are working on it. Okay. There will be updates on it. Yes, today in the initial launch, it will be physical, but we are definitely working on the cloud-hosted WLCs. Awesome, thank you. Yes.